Welcome everybody. Our guest spot for this unit is Professor Mark Newman. Mark is Paul Dirac Collegiate Professor of Physics and Complex Systems at the University of Michigan. He's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Mark has worked on many areas of complex systems, but most notably he's been a pioneer in the study of networks. His recent book called Networks An Introduction was published recently by Oxford University Press and it's the definitive place to go if you want to learn in depth about network science. So welcome Mark. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Our current unit is on networks. We've looked at some of the common notions used in network science, at least early in network science, like the notion of a small world network or scale-free network, the notion of preferential attachment, and I wanted to ask you, um, these were important notions in the early years. People talked about them a lot, but are they? do you think they're still relevant? Oh, absolutely. I definitely think they're still relevant. These are sort of some of the foundations of the field, some of the most important phenomena. Uh, it's true people at the research frontier are spending less time studying those things these days, but that's because I think uh, a lot of those questions have been sorted out and are quite well understood now. That doesn't mean the answers aren't uh, less important than they were. There are plenty of things that were discovered and sorted out a long time ago, relativity and quantum mechanics and so forth, but still really important things. So I think, yeah, these are the foundations of the field, very important ideas, but the research frontier has moved on to other things in recent years. So what, what's an example of some of the things at the research frontier these days? There are many different things, but uh, for instance, I think one important area uh, this is of interest to me and a lot of people these days is what happens when networks are changing over time. So most of the concepts that people discussed uh, in the early days of looking at this field were to do with static networks. I have a network that sits there, doesn't change, still has lots of interesting behaviors, but when we look in the real world, most of the networks we're talking about actually are changing on some time scale, be it a short time scale or a long time scale, and we're interested in know uh, how that affects the kind of phenomena that we're interested in on networks, uh, how we can model that, how we can understand the effects of changes. So an example might be the internet, for example, which, you know, if you're just interested in the structure of the internet today, one day, you can pretty well treat it as a static network. It's not changing very much. But if we want to understand how it's changed over the last 10 years, well, it's grown enormously in size and it's grown in very specific ways. Uh, it doesn't just grow randomly. There's particular patterns the way it grows and how is that going to affect, say, the performance of the internet. As the performance of the internet got worse because it's been getting larger, how could we change it to make it perform better? If we want, if we can control the way it grows, how would we like to do that So, it, in order to give it good performance as it gets larger? These are the kind of questions that one could tackle if one had a good understanding of what happens when networks change over time? I think that's a, a big growth area. So, so there's two ways two, two ways you could think about that. One is you could think about networks getting bigger, but also you could think about, say, information uh, being propagated over networks. And those, those are two right. different notions of sort of network dynamics. That's true. So people talk about dynamics of networks and dynamics on networks. There's also interesting dynamical phenomena that are going on on networks where the network itself may not be changing or not significantly changing, but something dynamical is happening on the networks, yeah, like the spread of information, the spread of data over the internet, or the spread of a disease over a contact network of people. How does the flu spread from person mm -hmm. to person? Uh, or the spread of a computer virus over a computer network, or the spread of uh, fashions or fads of, over a social network, the spread of uh, a rumor on Facebook, these kinds of things. These are all examples of things where the network itself is probably staying roughly constant in time, but there's some interesting spreading process or dynamical process happening on top of it. That's something that's also been a big area of research in the last few years. I would say we've made more progress with understanding dynamics on networks, those kind of spreading processes and so forth, than we have dynamics of networks where the network itself is changing. Um, there, there's definitely a, a, a lot of uh, open questions still in that area. Right. So what are you working on these days? What are you excited about? Uh, so that's definitely one of the areas that I'm excited about. Uh, for instance, I'm interested in questions like uh, if we can gain some understanding of how a network changes over time. Can we make predictions about how it's going to change in the future? 
Uh, um, more generally, we'd like to understand how to make predictions about networks. For instance, another area that I'm interested in is uh, can I make predictions about when network data are wrong? A lot of the network data we, data we look at, social network data, biological network data, it has errors in it. It's not all correct. And those errors can have an effect on our uh, understanding of the system. So we'd like to be able to understand those errors better. One thing that people have asked about is, can we predict which connections in a network are likely in error? You know, it says there's a connection between these two nodes, but maybe there actually isn't. Can I pick out no connections in the network that look sort of suspicious? They don't fit the pattern of the other connections in the network and say, that one looks like one that might have been an experimental error or whatever. Uh, the reverse of that question is, can I find connections that are not there that I would expect to be there? I see these two people are not connected, but I would have thought that they would be. That looks suspicious to me. Maybe that's an error. Or maybe it's not an error, but maybe I should suggest that those two people might like to become acquainted. Maybe yeah. they could tell each other something useful. Yes, Facebook um, tells me that all the time. <laughs> right, indeed, of course. And so, so this is an area in which people have done some significant work in sort of limited specific contexts without thinking more broadly how the same ideas could be expanded to other kinds of networks. So a classic example of this is uh, recommended networks. Like on Amazon, you buy a book and it says, oh, you might be interested in this other book. How does it do that? Well, it has a network representation of who bought which books and it tries to predict which links in that network are missing but should be added. Uh, so it, it tries to predict the ones that are most likely to be good connections. In other words, the books that you're most likely to want. So there's a whole uh, literature there on how you do that recommender task. If I have some subset of information, people and the books that they liked, can I predict other books that other people will like? And that's a link prediction task. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and other people as well, uh, one, uh, an area of current research is how can I do this kind of link prediction task on other kinds of networks uh, as well. And so, uh, so to some extent, that's a question of leveraging things that people have learned in these other areas as well. This is something we see often in complex systems, that there's somebody in one area, in this case recommender systems, who's made a pretty careful study of this. Maybe we can take ideas from there and apply it in a different context. Ah, okay. Um, I know you've done some work in the past on community structure detection in networks, where you try and look for communities that might not be apparent. Um, and I was wondering if that's seen any particularly interesting applications. Um, yes, yeah, so that is, this is an area that I have worked on. So the idea there is I have some big network and I believe that there are clumps or communities in this network. There are groups of people who are all friends or there's a group of web pages that are all linked together. Can I pick those clumps out? If you draw a, a simple picture of a network, it's often obvious where the clumps are, but now we're talking about very large networks with millions or even billions of nodes. You can't draw a picture and you certainly can't pick the clumps out by eye. So we're interested in developing computer methods for doing this on large scale data. Um, so, so people have been uh, working on this for some time. Uh, there, there are various uh, applications there that one might think of. Uh, for instance, I might be looking at the web and uh, you can uh, look at a web network and pick, pick out clumps of nodes which tend to be uh, pages that are all on a related topic or all sort of belong to the same people. Maybe it's a clump of nodes that's all at one company, stuff like that. People have looked at these kind of things. You can look at them in social networks. So for instance, people have uh, looked at various social networks and tried to pick out the groupings in them. If it's a social network of friends, then you're probably just picking out the groups of friends. But people have looked at it more broadly. For example, there was a famous study where someone looked at a network of which jazz musicians had collaborated with other jazz musicians. You can pick out uh, groupings of musicians that work together frequently. There's a, a famous concept in the, in the literature that actually goes back several decades um, uh, of so-called invisible colleges, which is uh, when communities organize themselves into groups that are not necessarily the official groups that they're supposed to be organized mm -hmm. into. So a classic example of this would be in academic research that we're supposed to be organized into physics and computer science and mathematics and engineering, but you actually find that the collaborations may be along completely different lines. Perhaps 
the collaborations are actually a bunch of these people in physics collaborating with these mathematicians on some problem or collaborating with these engineers. And so the actual collaboration groups divide along different lines from the traditional lines of the departments that people fall into. And so one can apply these kind of community detection algorithms to uh, networks of who's collaborating with whom and pick out those kinds of in invisible colleges. Now I know of some practical examples where people have had success doing things kind of like that. I don't yet know of successful examples where people have done exactly what I just described and succeeded in sort of determining uh, uh, invisible colleges that were not the traditional ones, not just traditional departmental lines. Um, but that's certainly the kind of thing that people look at. So an example of that is people can look at that in citation data which academic papers cite which other ones and look for clumps in citation data of papers that are all citing each other and then you can maybe pick out emerging fields. Here's a new area of research which is not yet sort of officially recognized but you can see it emerging in the literature because you see these clumps of papers that are all citing each other. So, so like this is definitely something that people are very interested in. Like network science itself has <laughs> that property. <laughs> I think network science is an excellent example of that. Of course it's now quite a well-established field but 10 or 15 years ago when there were only a few people working on it, uh, uh, I think that it would have been uh, interesting to do the study back then and you could have seen the, the new field uh, emerging in the literature uh, uh, it, uh, and actually sort of picked it out before it became a recognized area as it is now. One last question. Um, so as the author of a, a well-known book on networks, a uh, textbook, what is your advice to people who might want to go into the field of networks? How should they start? Um, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, I think there's various ways to get into it. Uh, the way I got into it was through a fairly tr sort of traditional background in theoretical physics. And I think that if you can do that, I think that that kind of thing is uh, a good way to start to, to get a solid background in whatever your chosen field is, which might be engineering or computer science or physics, or biology, um, and then look for applications in an area that you know about of, of networks. I think that there is something of a tendency in this field for people to treat networks as a hammer and go looking for nails. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm a network scientist, what can I do with what I know about networks? Whereas I, I really feel that uh, it should be driven by, I have a, an interesting scientific question that I'd like to answer, and it turns out that networks are a good tool that will allow me to answer that question. Um, so uh, I, I definitely sort of favor uh, it, having a strong background in some field that really interests you, and then uh, asking how can I answer questions in my field of interest using networks or maybe other complex systems hmm. tools. Um, Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been really great. You're welcome. Good talking to you.